the 2016 U.S. presidential race was not the first major election, marred by allegations of a dastardly plan by Russians to influence the outcome. Nearly a century earlier in 1924, the British public was shocked just four days before they were to cast their ballots by reports of Russian interference in the electoral campaign. Below are 20 things about that plan and other bonkers conspiracies and plots that actually saw the light of day. That other time when a major election was marred by Russian interference. On October 25, 1924, the Daily Mail published a letter from Gregory Zinoviev, chairman of the Comintern and organization headed by the USSR to advance global communism, to Britain's Communist Party, in its Zinoviev directed British communists to engage in treasonous activities in order to swing an upcoming election to the Labour Party. Headed by Ramsay MacDonald, Labour was deemed friendlier, or at least less hostile towards the Soviet Union than the Tories. Zinoviev's directives to the Communist Party of Britain included the subversion of British soldiers and sailors, and preparations for a military insurrection in working-class areas. Unsurprisingly the conservative press had a field day with the revelations, and in the final days before the election hammered MacDonald and Labour as tools of communism, on Election Day October 29, 1924. The Labour government was ousted from office, and the Tories romped to victory. The Conservative Party gained 154 new seats in the House of Commons, for a decisive majority of 412 MPs out of 650. It was then discovered although too late to do MacDonald, and the Labour Party any good that the Zinoviev letter was a forgery. A plan by partisan intelligence officials to swing an election with fake evidence. Ramsay MacDonald's Labour Party formed a UK government, for the first time in early 1924 however it was a minority government in a House of Commons split between Labour, the Conservatives and the Liberals. To say that the British establishment was less than happy to have a Prime Minister, from a socialist-leaning party would be an understatement. So it set out to undermine him and his government at every turn. On October 10, 1924, MI5 Britain's version of the FBI, received a copy of the Zinoviev letter dated September 15. It was determined to be a fake, and after it was shown to the Prime Minister, MI5's chief Vernon Kell agreed that it should remain secret. Secret, that is, until just a few days before the election, at the most damaging moment for Ramsay MacDonald, Kell or one of his subordinates leaked the letter in order to damage the Prime Minister's electoral prospects. A review by Britain's Foreign Office concluded that the letter was likely forged by Russian Tsarist exiles, angry that the Labour government had signed a treaty with the USSR, and agreed to extend it alone. They saw to it that it reached MI5. Between MI5 and MI6, Britain's version of the CIA conservative British intelligence officials ensured that, the letter reached the press just in time shiv the Labour Party. The British plan to link Irish nationalist paramilitaries with devil worship. On January 30, 1972, British paratroopers shot 26 Catholic protesters in Northern Ireland, of whom 14 died, an already tense situation known as the Troubles got orders of magnitude worse. Urban guerrilla warfare erupted, as Catholic and Irish nationalist hostility towards Britain skyrocketed. Many who until then had been content with protests, and civil disobedience now flocked to join paramilitaries, and shoot it up with the forces of the state. Before anybody knew it the British military and police had their hands full trying to keep a lid on things. British military intelligence turned to psychological warfare in an attempt to lessen public support for the paramilitaries. As the violence spiked through the roof, Captain Colin Wallace, a British Army psychological warfare specialist, executed a plan to link the emerging armed groups with devil worship and black magic. The aim was to create the idea that the paramilitaries, and their violence had unleashed evil forces. Against the backdrop of newfound fears triggered by the release of movies, like The Exorcist and The Devil Rides Out, Wallace and his men scattered upside-down crucifixes and black candles across war-torn Belfast. Simultaneously, the authorities leaked stories about satanic rituals and black masses, and tied them to run-of-the-mill crimes, in the last four months of 1973 alone, over 70 articles about devil worship, and the like were published, and a panic about Satanism swept through Northern Ireland. As Wallace put it years later, Ireland was very superstitious and all we had to do was bring it up to date. The manufactured hysteria also helped keep kids home at night, and away from buildings used by the authorities for undercover surveillance. A French plan to deliberately trap their own army as bait. Japan seized Indochina from France in 1940, and when the French returned to resume charge, after Japan's surrender and the end of World War II things had changed, 
the colonial subjects were not eager to resubmit to foreign rule and sought independence. The result was the First Indochina War. As that conflict wore on, France's grip on her Southeast Asian colonies was loosened by the increasingly assertive Viet Minh nationalist forces. On the plus side for the French, they had a decided edge in firepower. However, they could not get the lightly armed Viet Minh to offer the type of stand-up pitched battle in which superior firepower could prove decisive. At wit's end, a plan was hatched to entice the guerrillas to mass for a pitched battle, offer them an irresistible lure, that lure would be French paratroopers airdropped into an isolated base, Dien Bien Phu. The Viet Minh unable to resist the opportunity to destroy the isolated French, would flock to the area. The garrison kept supplied by air, would resist. They would draw in more and more Viet Minh into a battle of attrition, in which they would be wrecked by superior French firepower. The paratroopers were dropped into Dien Bien Phu whose main feature was an airstrip in a valley encircled by hills. As seen below things did not go in accordance with the plan. A brainstorm that morphed into a debacle. Things quickly turned sour for the French at Dien Bien Phu, and they discovered that many of their assumptions were mistaken. The French plan had assumed that the guerrillas lacked anti-aircraft capabilities, but the hills that ringed the airstrip were soon studded with flak guns. They formed a deadly gauntlet through which aircraft had to fly when they took off from or landed at the airstrip. So many planes were shot down that the French were soon forced to rely on airdrops for supply. Many of the airdrops missed their targets and landed within enemy lines instead. Another mistaken French assumption was that the Viet Minh would have no artillery. The Vietnamese commander, General Zop, organized tens of thousands of porters into a supply line to ensure that his men would have plenty of guns and shells. With sheer manpower, the porters hauled disassembled howitzers over rough terrain to the hills that overlooked the French. There, they were ingenuously dug in to render them immune from counter-battery fire, and were kept adequately supplied with ammunition. The besieged French were bombarded non-stop, and began to run low in supplies and munitions, relentless attacks reduced fortified positions one after another, and the defensive perimeter shrank steadily. Within two months the French were forced to surrender. After they lost 4,000 dead and missing, and nearly 7,000 wounded about 12,000 survivors were herded into Viet Minh captivity. It was the straw that broke the camel's back, and the French soon threw in the towel and exited Indochina. An ingenious weapons with a serious flaw. The sticky grenade or sticky bomb was one of World War II's more infamous, and hilariously inept weapons. It was developed by the British in the aftermath of defeat in the Battle of France, and the forced evacuation from Dunkirk. The British army got most of its personnel out, but most of its anti-tank weapons were left behind. So the British turned to a stopgap, cheap, and easily manufactured weapon for use against tanks. The anti-tank hand grenade No. 74, better known as the sticky bomb, was a maraca-looking device with an outer metal shell, that covered a bomb coated with an adhesive. The plan was that the user would pull a pin to remove the outer metal layer, and expose the sticky bomb, he would then run up to a tank, stick the bomb to it, activate a 5-second fuse, then run away or dive to avoid the explosion. Alternatively the user could throw the bomb at the tank, and hope that it would stick to its surface. The first problem, and it was a major one, was that the sticky bomb's adhesive had trouble sticking to dusty, muddy or wet surfaces. Dusty, muddy, and wet surfaces are a customary condition of tanks, as Churchill's chief military advisor could not help but point out. That was just the start of it. A weapon that backfired in hilariously gruesome ways. The sticky bomb had a second and even bigger problem. Not only did it often fail to stick to a tank like it should, it had an unfortunate tendency to stick to what it should not. The user. In cartoon-like fashion, the adhesive tended to leak and glue the bomb to its thrower's hand or uniform. As a result, there were likely many situations that would have been funny had they not ended so tragically and gruesomely. A sticky bomb user could pull the pin to arm the five-second fuse, then attempt to stick the bomb to a tank or throw it at one, only to discover to his horror that it was stuck to his hand instead. He would probably spend the last moments of his life frantically shaking his hand like Wile E. Coyote, with a stick of TNT glued to his paw, as recounted by a British Home Guard member, it was while practicing that a Home Guard bomber got his sticky bomb stuck to his trouser leg, and couldn't shift it. A quick-thinking mate whipped the trousers off, and got rid of them and the bomb. After the following explosion, the trousers were in a bit of a mess, though I think they were a bit of a mess prior to the explosion. Despite the shortcomings, 
the weapon was issued to the British Army and Home Guard in 1941, and remained in the stocks until it was declared obsolete in 1941. The ambitious plan to control the world's stock of this precious metal. Haroldson Lafayette Hunt Jr. was one of the richest men on earth, with a lock on much of the East Texas oil field, one of the world's biggest oil deposits, his sons Nelson William and Lamar, the last a founder of the American Football League, and Major League Soccer were also super rich. Especially Nelson Bunker Hunt, whose Libyan oil exploration and development made him even more fabulously wealthy. However Nelson became a crackpot, and feared that the U.S. government planned to steal his wealth. So to protect his fortune, he decided to buy a whole lot of silver, and hoard it in Switzerland. Then he decided to buy all the silver. Nelson Hunt eventually persuaded his siblings to join him, in a bid to corner the global market on the precious metal, the Hunt brothers went on a silver buying spree in the 1970s. When they ran out of money, they borrowed heavily to buy more silver. By 1979, they had accumulated about 100 million troy ounces, almost 7 million pounds of the stuff. That was almost half the world's transportable supply of silver. Then as seen below, they discovered that they had made a bad miscalculation. The 1970s was a good decade for silver. The Hunt Brothers' silver speculation caused its price to spike by over 800%, from $6 an ounce in early 1979, to over $50 by early 1980. The siblings made about $4 billion in paper profits, but in reality they had simply created a huge asset bubble that was bound to burst sooner or later. Their speculation created a global silver craze. As that precious metal's prices doubled, trebled, quadrupled, and continued to rise, people around the world began to melt silverware, and thieves went on a silver stealing spree. Tiffany's even ran ads that attacked the Hunt Brothers' speculation for making silver unaffordable to consumers. The Hunt Brothers had created a bubble market for silver. It was a bubble in which the Hunts themselves, as the world's biggest hoarders of silver, were most at risk. The Federal Reserve, whose mission includes the avoidance of such bubbles, stepped in and issued a rule specifically targeted against the Hunts. It banned banks from lending to precious metal speculators. As a result, the bubble swiftly burst, and the brothers' plan took a disastrous turn for them. The Collapse of a Plan to Control the Global Supply of a Precious Metal The bubble market created by the Hunt brothers burst on March 27, 1980, which came to be known as Silver Thursday, prices collapsed, and the Hunts almost immediately lost over a billion dollars. Their family fortune survived, however, and the brothers pledged most of it as collateral for a rescue loan package. Unfortunately for them, the value of their family assets declined steadily throughout the 1980s. By 1985 their net wealth had dipped from over $5 billion just before Silver Thursday, to less than a billion. Then things got worse especially for the genius behind the silver hoarding plan, Nelson Bunker Hunt, the Hunt brothers managed to hang on for much of the 1980s, but their luck ran out in 1988. That year they lost a lawsuit that accused them of conspiracy related to their silver speculation. They were hit with hundreds of millions in liability and fines. Nelson Hunt was hardest hit, and he broke the record for the biggest personal bankruptcy in America's history. His assets were seized and sold to satisfy creditors. They included his oil fields, house, bowling alley, and a coin collection valued at $12 million. An audacious plan to capture a city. After the French victory over the Prussians in the Battle of Jena Auerstedt in 1806, Napoleon ordered a vigorous pursuit of the defeated foe. As the Prussian field forces retreated, they were constantly harried. Simultaneously their static garrisons were rounded up, lest they link up with and reinforce their Russian allies who still posed a threat. The once proud Prussian army, less than two decades removed from its glory days under Frederick the Great, was demoralized after its disastrous defeat. It was against that backdrop that a French cavalry brigade, under General Antoine LaSalle approached the Prussian port city of Stettin. LaSalle had about 500 hussars under his command, and two light field guns. Stettin was a well-fortified port city with a garrison of nearly 10,000 men, protected by 281 cannons. They were under the command of a General Friedrich von Romberg, a veteran with over half a century of experience. His military career stretched back to the Seven Years' War, in which he had fought under Frederick the Great. Stettin was well provisioned by the British Royal Navy, whose supply-laden ships sailed in and out of the port with no hindrance. Given the disparity in numbers, 
Lasalle could not seize the city by force. So he improvised a plan to bluff Romberg into surrender. Audacity forced the surrender of a powerful garrison to a tiny force. On the afternoon of October 29, 1806, General Antoine Lasalle sent a subordinate, under a flag of truce to demand the surrender of Stettin, he promised to treat its defenders with all the honors of war. The garrison's commander, General Friedrich von Romberg, refused, and vowed defend the city to the last man. An hour later the emissary returned, this time with a more ominous message, If by 8 a.m. you have not surrendered, the town will be bombarded by our artillery, and stormed by 50,000 men. The garrison will be put to the sword, and the town will be plundered for 24 hours. An alarmed von Romberg consulted with the town leaders, they urged capitulation and that night the details of the surrender were negotiated and finalized. When the sun came up the next day, the garrison marched out in perfect order, and filed past the French to throw their arms down at their feet in a pile. It did not take long before von Romberg discovered just how tiny, was the force he had surrendered to. Instead of 50,000 men, the Frenchmen had barely 500, by then it was too late however and the Prussian general had little choice, but to stick to the negotiated agreement. LaSalle became a national hero, while von Romberg became a laughingstock. Stedden's erstwhile commander was tried by court-martial in 1809, convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment for his shameful surrender without a fight. He died two months later. The man with the plan to steal a U.S. territory. James Addison Peralta Rivas better known as the Baron of Arizona, might be the greatest con man that you have never heard of. He defrauded thousands of people, and literally stole most of the U.S. territory of Arizona from its legal owners. Rivas' father was a Welshman who arrived in America in the 1820s, and his mother was part Spaniard, and proud of her Iberian heritage. He grew up in Missouri and, in his childhood, Rivas' mother fired up his imagination, and filled his head with Spanish Romantic literature. As a result, he grew up with grandiose notions of himself as a hero in a melodramatic novel. That was reflected in how he spoke and how he wrote, both of which were reportedly overly grandiloquent and bombastic, when the Civil War broke out, an 18-year-old Rebus enlisted in the Confederate Army. He served in the 8th Division of the Missouri State Guard, and it did not take long before he realized that the military was not as glamorous as he had imagined. The tedium and travails of a soldier in real life were not remotely close to his idealized image of war. It was right around then that Rebus discovered he could make a perfect reproduction of his commanding officer's signature. So he came up with a lucrative plan. A Confederate Private Shady Side Hustle Private James Rivas began to issue himself passes with a forged signature, to escape the drudgery of soldiery, and visit his relatives, when other soldiers noticed that Rivas seemed to get a whole lot of passes, he modified his plan and killed two birds with one stone, give them an incentive to stay mum, and make some money while he was at it. He began a sideline business and sold forged passes to other soldiers. When the chain of command grew suspicious and began to investigate, he finagled a quick leave, ostensibly to get married. Rivas then promptly fled Confederate territory and surrendered to Union forces. He even switched sides and served for a while in a Union Army artillery regiment. After the Civil War, Rivas traveled to Brazil, and upon his return to the U.S., he got into real estate. In that line of business, he discovered that the talent for forgery that he had discovered and honed in his Confederate Army days could come in real handy, especially to clear up messy paperwork and fix vague property titles for clients who found it difficult to sell land because they were unable to establish clear ownership. Rivas established a reputation for his unrivaled ability to produce some document, as if by magic that everybody else had somehow missed before, and that cleared up ownership in no uncertain terms. A Forger's Path to the American West The discovered documents that cleared the titles of James Rivas' clients had simply been forged by him of course, then in 1871, a prospector named George Willing sought Rivas' help, with a large Spanish land grant 2,000 square miles, about the size of Delaware in the Arizona Territory. Rivas partnered up with Willing in a plan to develop the grant. In 1874 the duo decided to head to Arizona and make it happen. Willing got there first, filed a claim in the Yavapai County Courthouse, and was found dead the next day. Foul play was suspected. Rivas had made it to California by then, and was there that he received news of his partner's death, 
low on funds he got a job as a journalist, and in the course of his new occupation, he came in contact with some railroad magnates. He also came into contact with the Public Lands Commission, an entity established per the terms of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Its mission was to determine the validity of Mexican and Spanish land grants, in the territories won by America in the U.S.-Mexico War. The commission was corrupt to affair thee well, something that suited Rivas quite well. A corrupt public lands commission was this con man's dream come true. James Rivas learned that the Public Lands Commission approved most claims submitted to it, even frivolous ones, so long as a filer paid the examination expenses, coupled with a bribe he was good to go. That was good news because the land claim of Rivas' deceased partner, George Willing, was weak. Willing claimed that in 1864, he had paid $20,000 in gold dust, mules, and other goods, to a Miguel Peralta for the land in question. Unfortunately the deed of transfer was highly irregular, made on a sheet of greasy and marked up paper, without a notary or justice. However, Rivas had discovered just how easy it was to get the Public Lands Commission to approve a claim, no matter how iffy, provided that the right palms were greased, so he decided it was time to head to Arizona. As a start, he tipped off his railroad tycoon acquaintances to the deceased Willings land. Of course, he did not disclose his personal interest in that land. He told them that he could negotiate right-of-way privileges, for their proposed Southern Pacific line through Arizona. He then traveled to Kentucky, where he met the deceased Willing's widow, and bought his late partner's interest in the land. Next, Rivas used his newspaper connections to hype the land grant, and exaggerate the supposed solidity of the title claim. To strengthen his fraudulent plan this forger traveled to Mexico to tinker with its official archives. To buttress the solidity of the land claim sold by Miguel Peralta to Rivas' partner George Willing, Rivas fabricated a family history for Peralta out of whole cloth. He went about it in a highly creative way. Rivas knew that the way claims worked, people would check the archives. So to further his plan he went to Mexico, befriended people in its government, and inserted forged and artificially aged documents into the official archives. They established a fictitious family lineage of an 18th century Don Nemesio Silva de Peralta de la Cordoba, the documents inserted into the Mexican archives asserted that, Peralta was granted the title of Baron Peralta de los Colorados by Spain's King Ferdinand VI in 1748, along with the noble title came a huge grant of land in Arizona, the Peralta grant out of which Rivas intended to make a bundle. He added more fictitious documents in the Mexican archives, and created a family tree of the descendants of Baron Peralta. They eventually included an impoverished great-grandson, the Miguel Peralta who sold the claim to George Willing, from whom James Rivas, acquired the huge chunk of territory in central Arizona. The forger who became an American baron. James Rivas put in a lot of time, an effort to create the documentary trail of the aristocratic Peralta family. He traveled to Mexico City, Guadalajara, and Spain, where he spent days on end in museums and archives to learn the style and feel of old documents. He experimented tirelessly with various inks and chemicals and papers, to figure out the best materials and processes to produce forgeries that would seamlessly fit in with original old documents. He even scoured Spanish flea markets, where he bought old portraits of random people. He then designated them with the requisite forged documentary support. As members of the Peralta family, after he created the fictional family, Rivas decided to hedge his bets, and executed a plan to create a close connection between himself and the Peralta land claim. He married into the aristocratic Peraltas. The fact that the baronial brood was fictional was no insurmountable barrier for Rivas. He came across a 16-year-old orphaned Mexican girl named Sofia, and convinced her that she was a descendant of the noble Peraltas. By then, Rivas had honed his skills to such a degree that, he was no longer a mere forger, but a master forger. It was thus child's play for him to alter church records, and insert documents that made Sophia the last surviving member of the fictional but illustrious Peralta family. Once he had made Sophia the Baroness of Arizona, Rivas married her and through that marriage he became the Baron of Arizona. The Fake Aristocrat's Execution of His Plan to Steal Arizona Once he had carefully laid the groundwork, James Rivas finally sprang into action, and began to execute his plan in 1883, one fine morning that June, the inhabitants of central Arizona woke up to discover that, their land had been stolen from under their feet. Notices plastered all over public places, and printed in newspapers warned all and sundry, 
to communicate immediately with Mr. Cyril Barrett, Attorney at Law and Agent General, representing Mr. James Addison Rivas, for registering tenancy and signing agreements or regard themselves liable to litigation for trespassing and expulsion when the parole to grant is, as it must be, validated by the U.S. government. The land claimed by Rivas amounted to about 12 million acres. It extended from the vicinity of Sun City, Arizona, to Silver City, New Mexico, and included Phoenix. Throughout that territory, people were bewildered and incredulous at first. Incredulity turned to panic, however when they read that the wealthy owners of the Silver King Mine Arizona's richest and most powerful mining corporation, had paid Rivas $25,000 to avoid litigation. That was quite the princely sum back in those days. If such big shots had believed Rivas enough to pay him that much, it stood to reason that his claim really was solid. Suddenly the threat that their land might get taken, from them by this James Rivas seemed a distinct possibility. Even Uncle Sam nearly fell for Rivas' audacious con. James Rivas did not plan to actually evict the occupants of his barony, his plan was to simply extort as much money as he could out of them in rent or quit claim fees, in order to support himself and his noble wife in a manner that befitted an aristocratic land magnate. Surprisingly as it turned out, the large and wealthy landowners proved to be the easiest marks. From their perspective, it was cheaper and safer to simply pay the Baron of Arizona. The alternative was to fight in court, and run the risk of litigation that might end in the loss of their valuable properties. As seen above, Arizona's biggest mining company, the Silver King Mine, paid him $25,000. He also got the Southern Pacific Railroad to cough up $50,000. Thousands of others paid smaller fees. Together they added up to a nice bundle. At some point even the U.S. government fell for the con, and considered paying Rivas millions of dollars to settle the claim. All in all Rivas collected about $5,300,000 in cash and promissory notes, the equivalent of roughly $170 million today.